Bonsoir. Bonsoir à toutes et tous. Soyez les bienvenus à l'École des Arts Décoratifs pour cette deuxième conférence de notre cycle « Un déséquilibre précis à propos de l'idée que l'on a de la Suisse » organisé par notre école en partenariat avec le Centre culturel suisse à la faveur des travaux qui sont organisés au Centre culturel suisse et qui conduisent le centre à le délocaliser, sa programmation et à chercher des partenaires. Nous avons été très heureux que Claire Hoffman, que je salue, et le Centre culturel suisse se tournent vers nous pour organiser ce cycle de conférences sur le design graphique. Nous a, ce, ce cycle a été euh, conçu par le deux designers graphiques qui enseignent par ailleurs à l'école des arts décoratifs, André Baldinger et Philippe Millot, auxquels je céderai la parole après ces quelques mots d'introduction. Nous sommes très heureux aujourd'hui d'accueillir en français Jost Ochuli et dans votre langue, mon cher Jost, Jost Ochuli, de, très heureux de vous accueillir euh, ici. Le, vous êtes une, euh, voilà, une, une figure, une légende le, vivante, une très grande figure du design graphique, de l'édition, du livre, de la typographie. C'est un plaisir, c'est un honneur pour nous que de, nous avoir à, que de vous avoir à nos euh, côtés. Ce, cette invitation euh, remonte à, à loin puisqu'elle a été évoquée pour la première fois lors d'un échange à, à l'initiative d'Alexandre Dimos, designer graphique et le fondateur et directeur des éditions B42. Et le, il y a donc le, un an et demi, le, Alexandre, qui avait le, publié aux éditions B42 quatre livres déjà de Yost Ochuli, évoquait la possibilité qu'ils viennent en France et que nous organisions ensemble sa venue et une conférence à l'École des Arts Décoratifs. Le, le Covid, les aléas de l'existence, nous ont conduits à différer euh, cette le, conférence. Celle-ci peut avoir lieu aujourd'hui dans le cadre de ce cycle et nous en sommes très heureux. Je saisis cette occasion donc, pour le remercier euh, le Alexandre pour le, vous signaler euh, également qu'une qu discussion et qu'une signature sont prévues à 19h30 demain, à la, jeudi, pardon, jeudi à 19h30 à la librairie La Friche au métro euh, Charonne et euh, le Yost le Ochuli, donc le, voilà, signera le, ses, euh, ses livres et euh, le, engagera une discussion. Je vous signale également euh, le, que la publication euh, d'un autre le, livre est euh, le prévu, Typo Biographie, qui va sortir en quatre le, langues. Euh, le, C'est un livre en français, en allemand, en anglais, et en euh, français, pardon, en allemand, en anglais, en italien et en français. Et c'est un livre dans lequel Jost Ochuli revient sur l'ensemble de sa euh, carrière. C'est peut-être l'exercice auquel il va se livrer euh, ce soir. Et je vous remercie d'être venus si euh, nombreuses et si nombreux. Et je vous invite, André et Philippe, à euh, venir le, pour le mener cette discussion. Excellente soirée à vous et cette discussion pardon, sera suivie comme à l'accoutumée d'un petit verre de l'amitié qui nous permettra de discuter de façon plus informelle et qui vous permettra également, si vous le souhaitez, d'échanger avec notre le invité ou bien le André, Philippe, Alexandre ou bien entre vous. Excellente soirée à vous. Bon, C'est aussi notre grand plaisir d'accueillir aujourd'hui Yostro Houli. <coughs> euh, il a commencé son parcours graphique et typographie à l'imprimerie Zollikovar comme assistant de Rudolf Hochstetler. Rudolf Hochstetler est aussi une imminente figure euh, dans la scène euh, graphique et typographique en Suisse. Il était directeur euh, de Typographie Monatsblätter, la revue de l'imprimerie suisse. 
pendant plusieurs années. Et ensuite, euh, il, il continue comme apprenti compositeur. En parallèle, il suit à la Kunstgewerbeschule les classes de Walter Keich. Walter Keich était à l'époque la figure euh, qui enseigne à, à, à Zurich pour euh, le dessin du caractère. Euh, et en 1959, il s'installe à son compte à saint cal euh, fonde en 1979 la VGS, la Axgenossenschaft de saint cal euh, une édition qui est très fine et, et, et qui publie aussi euh, une, une partie des livres de, de Joost. Et <coughs> Il a assuré la présidence de cette, de cette édition jusqu'à 2004 et dirigé ça comme rédacteur concepteur jusqu'en 2011. Alors mon histoire avec Joost commence en 1992, euh, ici à Paris, pas en Suisse, parce que je tombe sur ces deux livres, édités à l'époque par euh, Pro Helvetia. Et euh, le premier était faire des livres et l'autre dans ce détail de typographie. Et euh, bah, ils ont dans, dans, dans mon parcours, mais comme dans beaucoup des parcours professionnels, des gens qui sont intéressés par ce domaine, devenu une lecture euh, de référence euh, qui, qui était rafraîchissante et, et justement très juste pour Uli. Alors, feu vert pour cette conférence. Merci beaucoup, Joost, d'être ici. Merci pour toi. Dear colleagues, dear friends, even before I was able to read, books fascinated me. The way one had to hold them in the hands to turn the pages, hearing the slight sound the paper makes, smelling the printing ink. As soon as I could read, Books became very important for me, and that has remained so all my life long. In an obituary of the Scottish book designer George Mackey, Robin Kinross wrote, George once showed me his library. I could see that he was a real reader with books on all kinds of subjects. As he said, this reading was a basis for work as a book designer. Exactly so with me. I was born 1933 in St. Gallen in Eastern Switzerland a small town of about 80,000 inhabitants with an elite university, an executive school of management, economics and law, and with a magnificent Abbey library with books from the seventh century onwards and marvelous manuscripts from the 10th, 11th, and 20th centuries, the hate of St. Gallen apiculture. After my ordinary school days and the classical secondary school in autumn 1952, I entered the arts and crafts school of my native town. There we were taught drawing, writing, lettering, and color theory, but not typography, photography, or video. Everything belonging to writing and lettering interested me. One of my teachers was Willy Baus, a former pupil of Rudolf Koch in Offenbach near Frankfurt. Baus showed me the works by the proponents of the then famous 
Swiss Typography. Bill, Lose, Neuburg, Ruder and others. Uh, title, double page spread, uh, designed by Richard Lose, and another double page spread from the same book. And Baus showed me also works by Willem Sandberg. Quite another world. During this time, I met Rudolf Hostetler by chance, and luckily he accepted me as a trainee. After a year, I began an apprenticeship at Zollikofer's in St. Gallen as a compositor. Zollikofer then was the largest and most important printing firm in eastern Switzerland. Rudolf Hostetler was born in 1919 near Bern and died in 1981 near St. Gallen. He had done an apprenticeship as a compositor and just before the outbreak of World War II, he had spent some months in London where he was in contact with Oliver Simon and Herbert Spencer two typographers who worked in a significantly different way. Oliver Simon in a classical manner, Herbert Spencer as a keen modernist. This is the cover of one of his magazines, Typographical. Oliver Simon, besides, influenced uh, Jan Tichold heavily when Tichold was changing from modernism to classic typography. When I met Hostetler, he was in charge of the small design bureau at Zollikofer. He was the artistic director of the house. At the same time, and for almost 30 years, he was editor-in-chief of the magazine Typographische Monatsblätter, TM. In those days, the most influential typographic magazine worldwide. The propagator of Swiss typography and of the typeface Univers. He was a friend of Emil Ruder in Basel and Adrian Fruttiger, or excuse me, Fruttiger, <laughs> <laughs> at Debony Penio in Paris. In this number one of TM uh, 1961, Univer was first presented with all the different fonts. Rudolf Horstetler himself was a gifted book designer, both in the classic symmetrical manner and in the asymmetrical way. These two books, type, the wrapper and the double spread, and the printer's terms, they are both conceived, compiled, written, and designed by Rudolf Horstetter in the same year, 1949. Type was influenced, of course, by Oliver Simon, and the printer's terms is uh, one of the very early example of the so-called Swiss typography. Rudolf Hostetler did what no other known Swiss typographer in those times did. He worked in both ways. 
the print of storms, it is outstanding, singular. A dictionary of technical terms of the printing industries in five languages and at the same time a technical book. There are other dictionaries in our field, but none that is also a technical book. Never before and never afterwards was a book of this kind published. In 1969, the fifth and last edition appeared. A new edition was planned for 1981, the year that Hostetler died. It didn't appear. During my year as trainee and afterwards as apprentice and as young freelancer, I was socialized typographically in the heydays of Swiss typography, the second half of the 50s and the first, the early 60s. In those years, there were two typographic and graphic hotspots in Switzerland. First, Basel with Emil Ruder and Robert Büchler as typographers and Armin Hoffmann as graphic designer. And second, Zürich with Richard P. Lose, Josef Müller-Brockmann, Hans Neuburg and Carlo Vivarelli, the editors of Neue Graphik, New Graphic Design, Graphism Aktuell, which appeared between 1958 and 1965. And besides of this person, there were also, and very influential, Max Beer. Seen from the outside, the difference between Zurich and Basel was not big. But looking closer, it was a difference. Basel, like Hostetler, preferred Univer. Zurich, Helvetica. Because Neuburg, Müller-Brockmann and others taught at the Hochschule für Gestaltung in Ulm, Helvetica was used there, spread very soon across Germany and became a worldwide success. Hostetler and I wrote Helvetica compared with Univer, banal and commonplace and thought it had been wrongly named. It should bear the name Germanica. There was no difference between Zurich and Basel concerning the dogmatic stubbornness. People like Chichold, then living in Basel, were not at all appreciated. In fact, they were hated. When Emil Ruder once visited Hostetler in St. Gallen, I heard him say, Tschichold is ein Verräter an der Moderne. Tschichold is a traitor to modernism. Although Hostetler, with his typographische Monatsblätter TM, was a proponent of Swiss typography, he estimated Tschichold. Hostetler, like Willy Baus, my first teacher, had a far broader view than the people from Basel and Zurich. This poster I had designed and set during my apprenticeship, pure ruder. And this is an advertisement from a series for a department store designed in 1960 
in my second year as a freelancer, also Swiss typography in the Basel style. <coughs> I must confess that I'm not altogether unhappy that I experienced this period and the way typography was done. You had to be very aware of the two dimensions you had to work on. The above and the below. The left and the right. And all the contrasts, the dark and the light. The big and the small. The line and the surface. The vertical, horizontal, the active, passive, and so on. But of course, the dogmatic way of Swiss typography was too much focused on the form as such and not on the form based on a content. And then this formal basis was too small. In my second year, as an independent graphic designer, I got the commission for a small brochure with medical science text. I very soon realized that with Swiss typography, I couldn't do it. No small caps, no old style figures, no ligatures, no knowledge of the finer points of scientific typography. I visited Hostetler and asked him for help. He gave me a friendly grin, took out of a drawer two books of a series with medical history texts designed by him. Here are two wrappers and this title, the double spread, and the double spread from this series. He said, this traditional typography is the only way you can present scientific text properly. And he was the editor-in-chief of Typographische Monatsblätter. Hostetler's office was an interesting and very lively place. Letters and telephone calls came in from all over the world, and he was frequently visited by typographers, graphic designers, type designers, printers, and publishers. From Paris came Adrian Frutiger, Remy Peño, and Roger Excoffon. From the Netherlands, Henri Friedländer, Sam Hartz, Willem Sandberg, and Maurits Enschede. From London, Stanley Morrison, Beatrice Ward, John Dreyfus, Herbert Spencer, and Hans Schmoller. Schichold's successor at Penguins. A frequent visitor was Günther Gerhard Lange from Berthold in Berlin, called Lange Schnauze or Gutenberg's Machine Gun. <laughs> and of course, there were all the champions of Swiss graphic and typographic design from Basel and Zurich, as well as Chichold and Max Gaflisch. Marvelously handwritten letters were sent by Paul Standard from New York, Alfred Fairbank from Bath in England, Jan van Krimpen from Harlem, Ulrich Menhardt from Prague, and here from Bern, Max Gaflisch. 
when those letters came in and before or after a visit, Hochstetler kindly told me about the person and what he or she did and he also showed me examples of their work. Only years later did I fully realize how lucky I had been meeting Hostetler. Decisive for me and my later work was the visit of Wilhelm Sandberg, who lived from 1897 till 1984. Sandberg was a Dutch graphic designer, art historian, and after World War II, for many years, a very influential director of the Amsterdam's Stedelijk Museum. Besides of other works, he designed almost all of the museum's invitation cards, posters, and catalogs in a very free, spontaneous, fresh manner. Quite the opposite of Swiss graphic design. Here, the cover, the back cover on the left hand side, the spine, and then the front cover, the right hand side, Experimenta Typographica, and a double spread from this project. He had it conceived, designed, uh, written and designed during the war, in the years 43, 44, when he was uh, under a false name in the underground. He was also, beside of all his other merits, he was a hero. Hostetler, whatever Hostetler could find by him, he bought. From Sandberg, I learned the combination of different paper and card. But Hostetler also collected other printed matter, whether anonymous or the work of a well-known designer. Wherever he was, in Switzerland or abroad, he visited antiquarian bookshops, second-hand shops, even junk shops, looking around for interesting printed matter of the expressionist, futurist, dadaist, surrealist periods. So, I was very early aware that besides Swiss typography, there existed other worlds of typographic language. Without the least effort, it broadened my views, and I also started my own collections of books, booklets, leaflets, broadsheets, and so on. So, for instance, the Christmas books of the Cambridge University Press, designed by Brooke Crutchley, who worked as a printer to the university in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s of the last century. His title pages are extremely noble, <coughs> and beside Oliver Simon, Jan Chichold, and Jan van Krimpen, he produced the best examples of centered typography. Nowadays, nobody knows him. It's a pity. The portrait of the typographer, type designer, illustrator, book designer, marionette carver, and playwright, W.A. Twiggins, better known as Bill Twiggins, says a lot 
der extrem giftet, Witty, ein versatile American, lived from 88 till 1956. In the course of time, I acquired a dozen or so of his books or booklets. Living with them gives me an immense pleasure and always stimulates me. Although you will never find one typical Dickens feature in my books. Another world, but also highly stimulating, modern Czech typography from the time between the wars, Karel Teige, Stenja Grossmann, Ladislas Sukna, and so on. Here, uh, a small browser A6, uh, designed by Karel Teige. On the left hand side, the back of a cover from this booklet. The front side is the same. And on the right hand side, the title page. And uh, a double page spread with his typographic illustration. But also after World War II, during the hardest time, communist times in Prague, you could find very inventive, spontaneous, fresh, and playful book design. A wrapper and a title in double spread by Aldrich Lafzer, who lived from 1909 and 1995. I own many, many books of this kind. Well designed books, but ordinary materials, ordinary techniques, ordinary prices, no private press books, small editions, high prices. The books I collect are firstly implements, implements for reading, for finding information, and if they give you aesthetic pleasure as a surplus, so much the better. A typographic work that has impressed me for many years and still impresses me anew every time I see it is the hymn books of the Roman Catholic and the Zwinglian Reform churches of Switzerland, of both churches. That also is extraordinary. It is the work of Max Geflisch. And because they are hymn books and therefore belong to the church, that I, to the churches, Nobody knows them, at least nobody in the typographic scene. The books, books they are published in 1998. Kavlisch had accepted the commission under the condition that not as planned Robert Slimbach's Utopia was chosen as a typeface, but Bram de Duces lexicon, the version with the short ascenders and descenders, a strong type, excellently readable in small sizes. Moreover, Gavlisch demanded for a slimmer format than the originally planned, one with the proportions fifth, five, to eight, which lies agreeably in one's hand. All wide spaces of the double page spreads are as small as possible. The back, the head, and the foot margins, and all other wide spaces are minimized. 
with the exception of the outer margin. Here, Gavlish placed the numbers of the hints, the most characteristic feature of this design. In this way, he saved a lot of space and nevertheless, in this position and together with the bold version of the lexicon typeface, the numbers are immediately found. About the same time, two German typographers, good typographers, also each designed a hymn book for two different Protestant organizations. The comparison with Gavlisch's book is not only interesting, it is also astonishing. Here again, Gavlisch. Here, the minimized white spaces. There, the lavish use of white spaces in the other two books. Both typographers were looking for nice typography. In this case, with the beautiful big numbers of Trump medieval, in this case, with a second color. Not so Gavlish. Is it modern typography? It is not modern typography. Is it traditional? It's also not traditional. What then is it? It is simply good, readable, timeless typography. And moreover, it looks fresher than the two other books whose typography seem weak compared with Gavlish's work. His goal was not, was a well-working implement. And it is, with more or less the same content, smaller and slimmer than the two other books, 125 grams lighter than the one, even 165 grams lighter than the other. So the handling of this implement is more agreeable. Sometimes looking for functionality results in more convincing books than looking for beauty or even creativity. Functionality, of course, not functionalism. This is a style which very often doesn't function at all. And besides typography by other typographers, I've always been fascinated and stimulated by all I see and experience on long walks and more days hikings in the nature. It's like there is a film unreeling on both sides of your way. You'll never be able to take in all the pictures you see, the trees, the bushes, the blossoms, the birds, the beetles, the snakes, and all the other animals, the ever-changing clouds, the ever-changing weather, the heat, the cold, the rain, the fog, the snow, the ever-changing geological ground. When I began as an independent graphic designer, I had long to wait till I got commissions for book design work. I had to do general graphic design, for instance, trademarks or symbols here for the Natural History Museum, St. Gallen, 
the end for nature, natura, natio, and uh, hexagon. Or for a firm, Agosti, a um, cabinet maker specialized in standardized kitchen. The standard here is a triangle. Posters for exhibitions at the Zurich Arts and Crafts Museum, for which I also planned and designed the exhibitions themselves and the catalogs. In the second half of the 60s, commissions for book design came very slowly in every year one or so. Then and even later, I never could leave on book design. The commissions were poorly paid and the series of the 17 Tipotone booklets and the 17 edition Ostrides were not paid at all. So working as general graphic designer was simply necessary. In 1976, I got the commission for a small brochure for the township of St. Gallen. The old gas works had to be demolished and new modern works were in planning. The authorities responsible wished to have a documentation of the old works for the archive, but also for an interested public to be sold in brochures, be sold in bookshops. Client and type photographer ask me not to trim the photos, but to show them as I got them from the photographer. The grid is therefore not a classical grid, uh, a classical Swiss grid, not to grid. Emil Ruder had prescribed or Müller Brockmann. In fact, it is not a grid at all. I think the brochure, after almost 50 years, still thinks very fresh and convincing. But on the other hand, of course, it is not thinkable without Swiss typography. It was published in the same year as Emil Ruder's typography, typography. Same year as this book. Some years later, I started <coughs> the Tipotone series, a series which was published yearly by the typesetting firm Tipotone. I was appointed editor and was free in choosing the topic and the typographic form. For many a booklet, I also wrote the text. There were a German and an English edition. Instead of being paid, I got some dozen booklets. Rudolf Horstäbler died in 1981. The first Tipperton booklet was published in 1983. I wished to publish it in memory of Rudolf Horstädtler and because Horstädtler was working in both ways, symmetrically and asymmetrically, as I mentioned. Uh, I tried to combine both 
principle in this first Tipotone booklet. There is an underlying vertical axial symmetrical line and at the same time a grid. One, two, four, three. Uh, one, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, three, four in the vertical. And in the middle, you have a, an axe, a vertical axis, and a horizontal axis. Um, and this uh, grid, this cross and grid over it allowed me uh, very different <coughs> double page spreads. Sometimes they look symmetric sometimes asymmetric, so, but they are always in perfect harmony. The underlying grid allowed very free arrangements without looking odd or out of place. The Tipotron series was a typographical playground because I was also responsible for the contents it allowed me to work in many different ways for instance in the following booklet and in the last one I will show you in this lecture the first deals with signs drawn by Adrian Fruttiger and with his text. The second is an ABC diarium with text from A to Z. It's a medley of shorter and longer texts I had written in the course of previous years. In September 1989, the A-Type Pi seminary was held east of Gdańsk in Poland, on the coast of the Baltic Sea. After the lecture and before the evening meal, Adrian Fruttiger, my wife Ursula, and I took long walks in the dunes and on the coast. During our conversations, the idea of a Tipotone booklet with signs by Adrian was born. It was mainly his idea. I consented, provided that he would draw the signs in a fresh, spontaneous way with a pen, a brush, or a crayon or a chalk. I didn't like his elaborate designs, signs and symbols he had shown in his book, um, type, sign, symbol, and in his Song of Songs and the Genesis. I found them inanimate, lifeless, dead, even boring, and even glitchy. After some weeks, I got a package with his signs. I was really happy. The signs were drawn with a greasy chalk on tracing of translucent paper, all with more or less the same measure. Most of the signs Adrian had drawn more than once, and with a, it was up to me to choose the best one. He had grouped the signs in 19 different topics Cretan, pictographs, Nordic runes, cross signs, signs of the elements, and so on, and so on. And for every chapter, he had written a short comment and captions in the marginal column. It's not a scientific work. At the end of his introduction, Puttiger writes, these signs have been assembled mainly in accordance with the aesthetic criteria. 
I trust that this small selection will give some idea of the individuality and beauty of old signs and symbols. And now, the double spreads. Here, the title page, together with the contents page, and some of the double page spreads. Every double page spread is different from the other. The signs were reproduced in real size as I got them from Adrian. Every time when I leave through the booklet, I am myself pleased how fresh they still look. At the end of the publication, um, I for once revealed and explained its typographical structure. Many signs are constructed within an imaginary square. So a square grid seemed appropriate as design basis for the pages of this booklet. Since the squares are not optically filled out by the signs, the outer and the inner margins can be relatively narrow. <coughs> to prevent the main column of text from appearing too wide or standing too close to the outer or the inner margin, it has been made narrower than the width of the two squares plus intervening space. For the same time, uh, for the same optical reason, uh, and also for practical reason, the marginal columns have been displaced to the left in relation to the grid. Looking at the printed double page spreads, they look orderly, but not rigid. The cover red, the wrapper brown gray, the first sheet a dark blue, the printed text red, but in a dark red, so that readability is not hindered. A next design. In the basement and under the roof of an old factory, no longer in use, a group of young artists organized an exhibition. They planned a companion book and commissioned a photographer and me as a designer. Every artist and his or her work should be presented uh, on a double page spread. After I got the different texts and the photographs, I realized that a certain principle of order would be necessary because the length of the text was extremely different and also the number of the pictures. A principle of order Yes, but which one? A grid a la Ruder or Müller-Brockmann? I found the idea boring and looked for another solution. It should, so I thought, it should be possible to find another order. And I began sketching. At the beginning, without the least idea 
whither the way should lead. But one day, out of my scribbles, I saw something like a nucleus around the crossing of the vertical and the horizontal middle axis. And in fact, that was it. I developed the grid which, a grid which allowed me different formats, upright or landscape, proportion two to three. No. That's a possibility. That is a possibility. That is a possibility. And so on. Above, below, left, and right of the cross. But um, very soon I realized that it's also possible to shift some of the um, illustrations on the cross, but on the vertical and the horizontal. And before um, designing the whole in detail, I made uh, many, many of those uh, pages to look whether this possibility, this so-called grid is uh, really working. We are asymmetric, we are symmetric, we are asymmetric, and here you shift, you see um, uh, a picture on the cross, not only beside the cr or above and below the cross. The two principles go, like in the Hochschild approach, very well together. No visual break between them. And the finished uh, booklet here with um, uh, construction uh, lines uh, for only for information. So, but here without. And if you look at this um, double spread, at the first, if you don't uh, know that there is a, a cross behind, you don't see it. And it works so with bigger illustrations. It works also with whole um, page illustrations. It works symmetrical, asymmetrical, with uh, only a few texts and with many, many texts. Unfortunately, I never afterwards had the opportunity to use this idea for another publication. And now the promised second Kipotom booklet and the last design I'll show you. An ABC diarium with text from A to Z around typography, books, publishers, and writers and related topics. It stands out of all my works in so far as most of its double page spreads look like posters. It is the most colorful of all my books and booklets and the freest. And as a contrast, there is the title double spread, quite spartan and quite simple. But although it is the most freest of my works, even this has an underlying construction, as you can see here. 
there are two columns and the decks have to be on one of those columns. Only the vertical position differs. Even if it looks free and spontaneous, it is far away from Sandberg's really free typography and his, in his catalogs or posters. A Swiss graphic designer of my generation, a Swiss typographer, moreover, may be able to like and even to admire typographical works like Sandbergs. But he cannot do it himself. In his DNA, there is somewhere a grit. And if not a real grit, then at least something near a real grit. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Joost. Euh, bon, vous avez aussi remarqué que toutes les, les interventions et toutes les invités qui sont ici, justement, ils, ils, ils montrent aussi d'autres facettes de la Suisse et de, de créer et de, de travailler. Et c'est un très bel exemple ce que tu nous as, nous as montré. Et euh, bah, si vous avez des questions maintenant, ce sera l'occasion de, de les poser. Tout est clair. Merci, merci, Yost. Euh, Est-ce que je le dis en, en je le dis en français? You, you understand? <laughs> if I if I if I speak French, is it is it okay, or do I have to uh, say it in English? It's just for the audience. Also, I can say it first in French, I and I you, you can understand. In, in French, you can say you can understand it. You can say it in English, but <laughs> I can say it in French. Um, Est-ce que vous avez imaginé dès le départ, dans votre formation de typographe, que vous alliez écrire et pas simplement typographier les textes des autres. Did you imagine first when you were taught as a typographer that you will um, write um, and not only typeset texts from others? Um, when I, I had conceived and then designed the booklet about Hostetler, I saw the form of the booklet first. Mm -hmm. I wrote in a form But I could only do it because I, wrote, I, I knew what it is. And the form here, mm -hmm. the Hostetler, was also the content mm -hmm. in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So form and, and, uh, and word uh, together, yeah. came together. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, of course, sometimes I had to shorten the text or I had to, to, um, uh, to alter the typography. Mm -hmm. And for such things, it is really um, important, always important uh, when you are um, um, conceiving, designing books, booklets, that you are on the one hand very principled, very um, um, consequent, Uh, and on the other hand, the, the principle should be very versatile. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A versatile principle. Mm -hmm. It's uh, maybe, uh, how is it the word in, in Latin? Conveniente. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Du sagst, es schweizer Deutsch? Uh, ein Widerspruch in sich selbst. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> Une contradiction en soi-même. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
versatile principle. Mm -hmm. Comme comme un déséquilibre précis. Something like this. Should mm. sometimes be uh, very um, necessary for um, uh, politicians. Mm. <laughs> little more versatile, <laughs> a, a little less. I, I may know the answer, but I, maybe I, I can ask the question. Uh, do you, m have you ever changed um, the way you thought you were going to, to set the typography um, in a book after you have read what you have to typeset? A typeface? No. <laughs> um, when, when you, m have you ever changed the design of a book um, after you have read the book and said, okay, the idea that I had first uh, for my design was not exactly what I, what I read. And then you change the design. Is this something clear or? Uh, you know, in <laughs> living in St. is far away <laughs> from the hotspots. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had, I was for about 20, almost 25 years, every year at the Eitapai, uh, Congress or later by seminary. I had friends in London, I had friends in Den Haag, in, in Amsterdam, so, but we, we mostly discussed other things, mm -hmm. not, not typography, mm -hmm. curiously. Mm -hmm. I know, so I, uh, I, un I understand, but. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't mm -hmm. uh, uh, answer your question. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Then I, I can stand. Okay. No, no. That, that's, that's back to again. Yeah. Yeah. Merci beaucoup pour cette présentation qui m'a beaucoup euh, intéressé et j'ai beaucoup apprécié le fait que vous fassiez état de toutes vos admirations. Et je me demandais si parmi ces admirations, il y avait des graphistes français dans votre euh, bibliothèque. Je vais faire la translation. Merci beaucoup de Katrin. Elle me demandait si vous avez fait des admirations que vous avez montrées aussi des œuvres d'autres designers like Hochstetter, uh, Dwiggings and others. Yeah. Um, is there also a French designer that could be part in this uh, selection? Is there one that you could include or? <laughs> you talked about ex, ex, ex a, a moment. Uh, yeah, but it, it goes now about, it's quite, well, still Cassandre. Cassandre. <laughs> but uh, it's not the book designer. It's, um, well, it's, that's a very, very interesting um, problem. Um, <laughs> should, should have an, another, another lecture. Um, in German and, and afterwards Swiss, at least uh, German-speaking Swiss typography came from before World War II, from Leipzig, from uh, Berlin, from Stuttgart, from München. And they had uh, the influences around 1900 from London. London, England, Germany, and then um, the Netherlands, the Nordic uh, uh, countries, and um, yeah, but 
Fran France, uh, Spain, it Italy, uh, the 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 Romanes, the Rom uh, countries, they had another tradition, quite another tradition, and. Uh, I experienced as a young graphic designer that um, our the typographers uh, in the French-speaking part of Switzerland hated us. <laughs> it was we were called Germans, and it was German style what we did. Thank you. <laughs> no, <laughs> we were not <laughs> the contrary. Uh, German style then was quite another thing. But uh, if, you, if you look at the typographic monatsblätter in the 50s, 60s, 70s, there was uh, a French part. And the French part was never like the, the, the cover I showed you. Never. It was always more or less symmetrical and it was weak, and it was, uh, it was really, it was not good, not even traditional good. And uh, it, it, was, it was another world. But on the other hand, when I see uh, Lieber Dachtis, so, but you, can, you cannot uh, compare it with, with, with his art, his type of typography. It's, it's quite an, it's typical French. And you find you you never find it uh, this sort of typography together with illustration somewhere else. Also, it's uh, I no, I, I really can't remember the French. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, something that was also interesting that you mentioned is between the two schools of Basel and Zurich. Mm -hmm. They were very much in the, um, in the front at a, a moment. And you, you mentioned also this in between to develop something that goes out and this that, that goes in parallel of, of, of these two uh, streams. And uh, what I found also interesting that, for example, Rudolf Hochstetler, his printed uh, terms, mm -hmm. he used uh, gill yeah. as typeface, yeah. which is English, and uh, which is also a, a character that has much more uh, humanity by its conception in it. Um, and I think also that the typographic uh, Monatsblätter that came out during the whole existence of this publication, that was period of Hochstetler was perhaps for me also one of the most interesting one because it was mm -hmm. really open, open-minded yeah. and uh, very diverse in the way how it, it, it was uh, making articles. Mm -hmm. And um, so the printed terms, you said it was thought that it will be edited in 1981s again. And this project then never was realized. No, no, that's... I can't go into the details, but shortly, it's a widow problem. A widow problem, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's a crime. It's a crime. It was uh, in format a little, a little bigger, and it was so, not so, but so. And uh, Hochstetter had really, since uh, 1969, till his... Uh, uh, illness uh, late uh, 1980 he worked every three hours on, on his puzzle and this was marvelous and uh, there was there were, was somebody uh, who would uh, continue the, the work on it but okay so then perhaps another question is you, you um, I mean, you or always uh, have very much attached to draw um, your letters also yourself. And you published recently one of your characters, 
with a uh, foundry. Yep. Can you tell us something about I this uh, this character and and uh, about uh, the doing it and and the aesthetic that you choose to do this? Um. <laughs> if you, uh, I had all my life long um, used letters. And someday I wished to know what that is to, to design a, a letter. That was the only reason. I, I didn't think, uh, I, I, I don't think, I never thought that the chancery I um, designed, the Allegra, should be the letter. It's one of letters, but it's my letter. And I, I did it as, um, as well as I could do. And yeah, that is it. Okay, <laughs> thank you. It's, uh, it's not dramatic. No, no, but it's interesting because also the, the aesthetic that you choose, uh, yeah, yeah. You, uh, I mean, it it's tells us also a story about uh, your way to, to, to your access to aesthetics and what you, you like, uh, how, to things are cre how things are created, so. Uh, but I, I use uh, my own letter very, very sparingly. Uh, Well, uh, um, there are I know a uh, type designer um, who gives all this the, the, the type I have to die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, there are so many very good um, typefaces. Why should I use only mine? Uh, I agree with you. And I mean, the, th the projects are different and the language and the aesthetics that you can transmit are different, so, yeah. And moreover, I, I never felt that I would be able to uh, design uh, a serif typeface. I couldn't do it. I, I'm not in the design field to do it. I only am able to, to design a, a sensory. And there I had some, some no reason, is a big word, but some idea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Est-ce qu'il y a encore une question? Um, well, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. But um, maybe a question for also the younger upcoming designers, um, have you ever experienced the fear of having to come up with new things even though somehow everything's already designed, everything's already created? There's no way I can invent something new to, for example, das Rad neu erfinden? <laughs> and how to, how to deal with that fear, how to get rid of it maybe? Ist es dir das auch schon passiert, dass du im Moment irgendwie dir die Frage gestellt hast, also der Druck, immer wieder etwas Neues zu machen, ist das ein, ist das ein Thema gewesen oder ist das eigentlich etwas gewesen, was dich eigentlich nicht berührt hat und du einfach versucht hast, in deiner Philosophie Sachen dir selber treu zu machen? Buchstalten. Gestaltung allgemein, ja. Ja, if you... Um, if you leave to the 17 Tipperton booklets and so, you see only the format is the same. Uh, most have different types, uh, and um, all the topic were all the topics there also. And so, if you are designing for a certain topic for a conference, then the design must be different. So 
it's not the question, should I do it? But you have to do it. If you are not, uh, uh, there, is, there are graphic designer, you could see from far away that is so, that is so, that is so. We always had this type, we always made that, we always, so that is boring. The topic is, the topic is interesting and you should, I, sometimes I think those people don't read. <laughs> they, for, but uh, you can, you can, uh, a text, a blind text, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's only the form which is interesting. And uh, no, we write and uh, we speak to, uh, to convey uh, a content and so with, uh, with design. You have to do always uh, another thing. If you are re really interested to bring the contents over, <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> there was also you also an answer to part of the question that Philip was asking: uh, at what point the content influence afterwards your design? And so you gave the answer now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Joseph.